everybody. Uh, I will speak today about farmland birds. Uh, uh, just to introduce ourselves, uh, they are uh, Czech Society for. I am working in the Czech Society for Ornithology, uh, which is non-governmental voluntary organization with special focus on birds. Uh, we are happy that we are increasing in numbers. We have almost six thousand uh, members currently, and I started. To, 18 years ago, it was uh, something between 1,000 and 2,000, which is good because we need people to, to move things forward. Uh, originally, it was purely a uh, research-based organization, uh, but uh, lately, together with our umbrella organization, BirdLife, we are also more and more active in policy work. We are trying to also do some education public awareness uh, about uh, the need to protect the birds and their habitats. And, uh, and uh, as I already mentioned, we are partner of BirdLife International in the Czech Republic, which is great because BirdLife, uh, it is umbrella is working very good. And especially in the field of agriculture, it's very active uh, <clears throat> on uh, European level, on EU level in Brussels, but also uh, in the whole world. So this is the introduction. I will start slightly, maybe um, a little more ge um, <clears throat> general. Uh, agriculture is here for more than <clears throat> almost 11,000 years. So definitely uh, human activity in agriculture somehow is influencing uh, its environment for a long time. Uh, it started uh, in the most uh, <clears throat> fertile uh, areas, back those in those years when some civilization uh, was present and it spread started to spread to all of the world uh, in czech republic or bohemia uh, where <coughs> we are active uh, agriculture started to, to be more <coughs> visible in the middle ages uh, on this picture it's you can see that uh, a lot of areas were somehow forested, uh, <clears throat> but uh, agriculture started to, to, you know, to spread mainly around the cities and the settlements. And thanks to this, uh, we have uh, got some species that originally probably weren't present here or very uh, rare, like skylarks, crested larks, uh, gray partridge or gray bastards, uh, the species that were originally stepic. And thanks to agriculture, they, um, they got the chance to spread uh, to, to whole Europe and <clears throat> to increase in numbers. What has uh, been, uh, what has changed? Uh, well, the, the time when uh, agriculture land has changed very dramatically is the last century. Uh, of course, during the centuries, uh, the you know the area of, of farmland was slow, was larger and smaller, uh, especially war. Wars uh, in in the, in the in the last ten centuries have some impact on the area of farmland, but the the, major, the changes that happened in twentieth century uh, were definitely the most visible and quite fast. On this picture, you can see the situation in Czech Republic in fifties. On the left side, on the right side is the same area. Uh, currently, in recent days, so if we look. And the numbers, uh, there was a process called collectivization and uh, this process was driven to get more uh, farmland, to be more efficient in farming. And we lost uh, about 800,000 kilometers of uh, borders or field, board, uh, field margins. Uh, we, we, have lost, uh, we have lost field roads, uh, line greenery, and the size of the field has increased more than uh, 10 times. Uh, so, but it's quite visible on the picture. It doesn't have to be uh, described in words. Also, what has happened uh, in, you know, in, the, in the fight to get new farmland, uh, the, a lot of land was irrigated. It's uh, about a quarter of the farmland is somehow irrigated. And again, on this picture on the left side, you see what is in purple. Uh, it's area somehow uh, being irrigated uh, in uh, in the past, and on the right you see some technical uh, irrigation uh, done by farmers on their own uh, in recent years. So this is the process that's 
still is happening. Farmers are uh, fighting with the water because they need they want to have um, solid uh, soil where they can plant uh, the the, uh, the you know the, the crop and uh, uh, so when water appears in the field they usually have they have, they have to deal with it some, somehow and sometimes they still do some technical irrigation of course mechanization was is quite fastly developing uh, just 100 years ago, it was typical to work with horses, very slow, and the people saw everything around them. Nowadays, in uh, big tractors and combines, uh, people get uh, slightly uh, away from nature and uh, they just, uh, <clears throat> you know, they just don't see the things as they used to see them in the past. Of course, uh, those big machines, ma machines need uh, some good playgrounds, so it's also another pressure to landscape features. So optimal is a uh, field like uh, the one on the right side, uh, quite rectangle, uh, uh, without any complication, and that's, that's perfect. Uh, of course, quite important uh, change was the uh, start of the chemical, chemicals and pesticides used in, uh, in farming. Um, on the picture on the left, you see that during uh, communist time or social time, uh, the, the use of pesticides was, was quite high uh, and it stopped in 1990. Then we dropped down and uh, another increase started in 2000, uh, say six, and it was the result of the Czech Republic joining EU and uh, with this. Uh, accession, we also got money that are now floating to agriculture and uh, boosting another intensification. Uh, the overall impact of the intensification has been described in many studies. Uh, these two were done by uh, Donald uh, and his team, and they show that uh, with uh, increased uh, cereal yields uh, in tons per hectare, uh, the uh, mean population trend is decreasing, and this study was uh, done twice for periods 1970-1990 and then 1990-2000. And um, you can see that the, the trend is uh, copying uh, <coughs> the, the serial years, so it's quite clear that intensification is a problem <coughs> in most of the cases. Of course, it's not just the farming that is a problem for the farm members, but also other factors, separation, poisoning, fencing, unsustainable, unsustainable hunting, illegal killing, uh, pollution, invasive species, traffic. So the overall picture is uh, definitely uh, influenced also by some other factors, but uh, the farming itself is the key and main driver of the uh, decline of the birds. Uh, one of the typical species of the farmland in, uh, in, I would say, in Europe, but definitely in Czech Republic, would be grey partridge. And you see that uh, in the 50s, the, the number of hunted uh, grey partridges were around was more than five, 500,000 birds killed every year. And despite the birds started, they stopped to be killed. Uh, the overall number of the grey partridge fell down from almost uh, 900,000 in the 60s uh, to current situation, which is about eight to 16,000 birds. So it's definitely a very steep decline. And uh, gray partridge, uh, which is very well-studied species, uh, doc is documenting uh, all the problems of the farmland. In Western Europe, uh, it's mainly the chemical industry and the use of pesticides that started the decline. In Czech Republic, it was combination of both the total destruction of the country uh, heterogeneity and, to get, and uh, followed by use of uh, chemicals. So definitely grey partridge. If we recover grey partridge, we will get a vital and healthy country. Another bird documenting impact of the uh, <clears throat> intensification process is left being uh, here in this uh, white area, uh, the irrigation of the land, plowing of the meadow and followed, uh, followed by irrigation has, uh, has uh, done. And uh, it was the time and uh, the number of uh, lappings started to fall down and it 
never recovered again to the numbers that used to be in this area before those uh, this uh, this um, irrigation period in 70s so uh, it's not surprising that we have lost some birds uh, it's just uh, necessary to say that all those species uh, that are mentioned here were uh, were never uh, common in Czech Republic they uh, there are some usually smaller uh, some stable populations but not huge numbers but uh, we have lost great bastard in southern Moravia, a uh, European roller and the red back shrike in the same area, curlew uh, that was breeding uh, in also in some part of uh, Western Czech Republic and also stone curlew. So these uh, species we have lost, but uh, also some other species are getting close to extinction, especially in Czech Republic. A uh, little old that used to be quite common uh, at the beginning of the 20th century now has only about 100 pairs. Uh, bar old that wasn't that common, but still relatively common, has only uh, 100 to 150 pairs. And Orpel Barting, but this species is not, uh, it was quite rare in the past. So again, it's disappearing, and we have only 100 pairs of this uh, species. If you look at the monitoring scheme that is showing what is happening with farmlands, uh, birds, and not just them, uh, you can see that uh, forest species, the, the green line, is does slowly, slowly uh, decreasing in numbers. All the species are, are remaining about uh, the, uh, the remaining stable because um, species more focused on intravillan are increasing. But definitely you can see the decline of the farmland birds that is going uh, <coughs> continuously until those days. And if you, if you look closely at this decline, uh, you can see that after the break in 1989, there was an uh, increase in numbers that could be connected with a, a, low, a lower use of pesticides that I already showed before. Also, uh, suddenly, uh, the system of the farming has changed. Some small farmers started to run their business. Also, some fields were left untouched, so they were they became fallow. So, countryside was diverse with less chemicals, and the reaction of the birds was quite immediate. Then the situation how somehow stabilized. So, people uh, the birds again. Uh, Drop down, and then in 2004 we joined EU, uh, and as I already showed in pesticide use, the further intensification started, and the decline is still con uh, going on until those days. If you look at some birds that are disappearing quite strongly, then it will be meadow pit, 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 pit and uh, yellow wagtail. The both species are somehow connected to uh, bad uh, features in, in the farmland. They are breeding relatively late, so um, management or mesh, um, activities, farming activities that are happening early in the breeding season have some uh, negative impact on breeding. So it's not surprising so much. Definitely, meadow pipit is doing better in higher uh, position in mountains compared to lowland. Uh, skylark and crested lark. Uh, especially crested lark has very unique uh, habitat uh, requirements. They used to be somehow connected with a very bare land, uh, some dirt roads, uh, and uh, nowadays they uh, they occur mainly in intravillan in cities or next to the gas station or something areas like that. Skylark is uh, again the, the, the typical farmland species slowly disappearing from our farmland. Turtle dove and yellow hammer, both species are disappearing. Turtle dove more than 40%, yellow hammer, uh, let's say 25, 30%. So they both copy the trend uh, of the uh, common bird monitoring scheme. But we have also some species that are increasing number, uh, especially uh, uh, <coughs> Sturnus, uh, common starling is a, a unique exception because in Western Europe it's decreasing in numbers, but in Czech Republic it's increasing and it's stable increase more than two times higher, two times um, the population more than twice 
bigger than it was in 1982. But also uh, some birds like crane are more and more visible and, uh, and appearing in the farmland. Uh, and slightly increasing is also common quail or uh, windshed. So if you look at the birds, what they need, you know, what, what is the problem, uh, what we should uh, focus on, they need three basic things and it's a safe breeding place. In this picture on the left, there's a, a gray partridge sitting on the nest. And if you think how many eggs is a uh, gray partridge uh, 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 producing and how much time uh, she needs to uh, be safe and she's sitting on them, uh, you can imagine that it's a very risky time and it's uh, the, the, one of the biggest problem for gray partridge is uh, survival of the female sitting on the nest. And if the habitat is not, uh, you know, with good quality and uh, then of course the predation is much higher than, than if you offer a safe breeding place to the species. Sufficient feeding option all year round, especially during breeding season. Again, it's quite uh, quite clear that uh, if uh, the bir if birds are, uh, the, the juveniles are getting enough food, they are growing fast, uh, developing uh, much quicker compared to the situation where the food is not available, and they are also very more uh, uh, they have better conditions to escape from predators. So it's quite uh, quite crucial to be successful in breeding to have sufficient uh, food supply. And of course, some birds need some shelter or height or feeding options during also winter. So it's also a very critical period of the time when birds that are staying in the Czech Republic and not migrating to, you know, to usually uh, Mediterranean or uh, Africa, uh, they need to have sufficient food supply to, to survive the winter. So how to support farmland birds? Uh, there are some activities like direct protection of the nest or breeding sites. Uh, the, the, another option is common agriculture policy because there are some tools that uh, are uh, originally targeted on biodiversity and bird protection. Uh, there is also some options of active support of birds, uh, creation or revitalization of the farmland or close and mainly what is what is maybe slightly ahead and you know, slightly aside from those actions, but uh, not, uh, I would say that it's uh, at least the most uh, as important as the others is close cooperation with farmers, educate, educating them and explaining them uh, what they can do, how it can be done and all those issues. So if we look at it um, closely, direct protection of the nest, uh, in, on the picture on the left, you see Montagas Harrier, uh, this bird of prey is uh, mainly breeding in farmland. Uh, quite, it is usually it's, it's some cereal, but it uh, can be also a field of alpha alpha. And uh, especially for this this bird, there is a group of ornithologists that are searching for the nest. And they are prote protecting them by using those small fencing around the nest. And this, the bird is increasing in numbers. And definitely direct protection of the nest of the species in this case is probably the crucial uh, protection that is helping them, helping the species. We also are trying to search for nest of the laughing, uh, but in this case, uh, the number of laughing is uh, relatively high. It's uh, in Czech Republic, it's currently six to 9,000 birds. So uh, direct protection is uh, helping maybe on the local level, and definitely it's bringing some uh, awareness to farmers that they have this species and they could do something for it. Uh, actually, there are already farmers that are themselves searching for the nest when they are sitting in the tractor. They look around and when they see the nest, they are uh, protecting the nest on, the, on, the, on their own. So that's great. But definitely the, it's, uh, it's not the major protection tool to to serve uh, to to you know to uh, on the long term to to protect the lapping. So compared to Montagu's area, in this case, it's not that important for the population itself. Uh, in case of concrete, we are using also data from monitoring. So if we see the the position of the bird, we can go to the farmer and we can tell him, could you please leave some small area around this position? 
and uh, this way you can uh, keep the optimal breeding habitat and maybe you will also save some nests that could be already there and it's so uh, it's difficult to say how effective is this but definitely we know that in some cases it's been used by concrete so we are trying to use this uh, uh, tool as well CAP, Common Agriculture Policy, is a huge uh, amount of money coming to agriculture. And recently, it's uh, the environment and biodiversity protection is more and more important part of it. As, you, uh, as I showed you earlier, the overall trend is still negative. So definitely, CAP is not uh, functioning optimally in this field, but definitely it offers some options, especially uh, uh, agri environmental um, climate uh, measures. We have uh, in Czech Republic, we have some of them that are focused on birds. The one is focused again on lapping on arable land, but not just the lapping, but also uh, as, as all the species that are sharing this habitat with him from Skylark uh, to till some uh, other major species. And in, in um, you know, this brief description of the measure is that Farmers don't do anything during breeding season, and then they plant some uh, pollinators uh, flowers. So in the second half of the year, it's uh, it's providing uh, uh, nectar and uh, food options for pollinators and other species. So it's quite nice measure. I like it. Uh, of course, uh, then we have measure for concrete. It's uh, based on delayed moving. Uh, on the pre-selected size. So again, based on the monitoring, we we make a, a layer of the uh, optimal breeding sites of the species and a farmer can decide uh, in some cases voluntary when it's open uh, landscape and in nature protected areas, it's usually somehow uh, discussed with the uh, uh, nature authority and they finally decide what, which sites will go to the scheme and which sites will be in other uh, uh, scheme focus maybe on flowers or you know, other uh, other species or taxa. Then we have a measure called BioBelts. Uh, currently we have two versions and maybe we will have three versions. Uh, and these BioBelts are providing uh, cover, uh, food uh, and hide for birds. And it's quite, it seems that it's working quite good, but the, the total number or uh, total area covered by BioBelts is very low in the Czech Republic. So again, to make some uh, impact that is visible on national level, this measure would have to increase several times in, in, uh, in area. Uh, as I mentioned, we have already prepared a new scheme, a new bio, a new bio belt version. It's called combined bio belts, and uh, it consists of grassy strips or grassy clover strip, uh, where it's, which is white enough to, to, to uh, to uh, give a grey partridge safe nesting site, and next to it there's a feeding bio belt. So the version that was already he he here before, where grey partridge can feed and eventually hide in the winter. So active support for birds. Uh, one of the options is you know uh, working also for farmers, like some uh, um, visible. Uh, I don't know how to say this, but uh, this is a position where can birds of prey sit and they look around and they can catch some uh, uh, <clears throat> small rodents like this kestrel. Uh, again, picture of, uh, of the nesting box. Uh, and this is the example that uh, by active support of the birds of prey, you can really increase the number of them. Uh, in this case, especially kestrel is using them, was using them in the long term quite uh, effectively. And it's working for birds of prey and all owls as well, you know, long-eared owl and tawny owl, but it's working also for the farmers. So this is example of a uh, win-win situation when by protection of the birds, the birds are doing some basic uh, control of the rodents and farmers are not forced to use more chemicals or rodenticides then they could be in case that you know this is this balance would be kept through this uh, natural uh, support of uh, birds of prey. Uh, revitalization of farmland. This is picture from ornithological park called Josefuske Loki uh, that is uh, that we have started uh, 
in 2008. And currently, Czech Society for Ontology is building new reservations, new parks uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, so uh, again, it could be, this is usually a local thing, but uh, can be used as a demonstration site and it's working very good. Close cooperation with farmers. Uh, as I mentioned, this is something slightly different, but for me, it's quite important because uh, farmers are, should be our allies. And if they will be convinced that uh, supporting biodiversity and keeping healthy landscape is good for them, then it's uh, optimal also for us. So spreading examples of good uh, practice, uh, we are trying to find some farmers that are already doing on their own good things, like uh, protecting the nests of flappings, or uh, maybe using uh, higher variety of the species of the crop, uh, crop uh, plants uh, in, or planting of uh, bushes or trees in the farmland. Uh, it's good to have model farm with solid monitoring. I am using quite often example of Hope Farm from, uh, from the UK, uh, Hope Farm, which is owned by the Royal Society for the Bird Protection. And from the first moment where they started to run this farm, they also did monitoring of birds butterflies and uh, they also add some uh, bubble bees later on and the data are, are just strong. They show that if you do the right measures in the field, then the reaction of the birds and biodiversity it's, uh, itself is, is immediate or almost immediate and it's, uh, and it's working. And also they want to show that it's economical, that if you, uh, that it's uh, possible to combine economic profit and biodiversity benefits. Uh, searching for win-win solution. This is again, it could be example of home farm or example of those nest boxes for birds of prey. You're supporting the birds of prey and at the same time, you are getting something from it back. Transition of farming based on research and science because of course, research and science is, is going, uh, is uh, bringing new, new data and new options so it needs to combine those things somehow. And of course, uh, we need to have, if, if the farmers are getting any subsidies, we need to have, uh, they, they need to be based on solid environmental standards. So uh, it's not uh, possible that uh, the subsidy are somehow causing uh, problems in the country, uh, especially from an environmental point of view. This is again a picture that uh, how win-win situation solution could look like. Uh, this picture is showing yields of uh, in the field, and as you can see, the the blue color is the most effective one, and the red, almost uh, red, going to almost dark, is uh, the least effective parts of the field. So uh, farmers can uh, uh, decide. If, if they are making decision where to put measure that is supporting biodiversity, they can use those maps and uh, they can optimally place it uh, to the field, parts of the fields that, not, that, that are not so effective uh, in farming and could be much more beneficial uh, to, to be used for biodiversity support. Well, and that's uh, everything from my side and I am welcome to discussion from, from you. Okay, thank you very much, Václav. Uh, very, very interesting. I loved it. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. I'm gonna open the, the room for questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have any questions? Okay, okay. hello. Uh, I have a question. You know, you, you mentioned cooperation with the farmers, it's important, but I think there are stakeholders which are also important, and these are common people. You know, in Czech Republic, we are used to cheap food. You know, and every, any kind of this measure means more expensive food. And I'm worried that the people in, living in the town basically don't recognize that some birds are decreasing because in the towns you have quite some birds still. And no, common people don't go to the, no, our agricultural land because it's absolutely boring. So they don't realize that there are some birds missing. So uh, probably it's time to start some campaign with the common people to tell them that the cheap food is something that is actually not so cheap. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Uh, I mentioned farmers because for me, farmers are, uh, I want them to be my partners, uh, but definitely uh, there are already now some uh, some movements uh, in public uh, and even some big uh, uh, some big um, companies like Nestle or those uh, providing food are uh, more and more uh, curious about the way how the food is produced. You know if, how much chemicals uh, is being used, and this trend is definitely visible. And it's probably it's somehow connected also with climate change because uh, people realize that uh, people things that don't have to remain the same as it used to be. So definitely climate change helped uh, to raise the question, what is the condition of the farmland, you know, and how stable the, the industry and farming is. So yes, totally agree. Uh, we did petition with the hunters uh, two years ago and uh, we succeeded to have 65,000 people signed the petition asking for a recovery of the farmland, which is a quite strong message to the ministry. And definitely, I can imagine that this uh, public awareness should be, you know, even higher. And people getting richer now, they can afford to buy food uh, that is produced eco economically and environmentally friendly at the same time. So, and the differences in prices should be that high. Uh, and of course, the subsidies should be rewarding the farmers that are doing organic farming and doing more niche, uh, more environmental uh, you know, production uh, by more money. And this is, the, this is something that we would like to change, that uh, this money going from public, uh, you know, through CAP, should reward farmers to do something which is really beneficial. Uh, building on the previous question about the farmers, I would like to ask you if you um, if you see any improvement or improvement of uh, of the farmers' attitude uh, to this issue. Uh, I do, I do. <laughs> they are forced to uh, somehow think about those things. So. Ten years ago, uh, association of the private farmers, which are family-owned farmers, usually. Uh, were speaking about nature and they were trying to show that they are different compared to the big uh, cooperatives or big companies. Uh, this, uh, I can see that uh, even those representatives of big companies like Agrarian Chamber or Agriculture Union are speaking more and more about need to tackle problems, environmental problems, including biodiversity. For me, uh, it's still not fully uh, uh, honest from their side. They, they, they know they need to speak about it, but they are not willing to do as much as they could, as, as I see it. But definitely uh, organic farmers, uh, association of the private farmers are green, relatively green in, in their thinking. They have members that already do a lot of great stuff uh, that could be, you know, used as a uh, model farming. Uh, or now there is an eco eco region uh, uh, that is in, uh, that is being established uh, uh, south of Brno, uh, and it's uh, two thousand hectares, almost two thousand hectares of organic farms, uh, seven companies, and are trying to uh, from their own vision to support biodiversity so it's a uh, bottom up approach from farmers going uh, going up so so there are already activities actions uh, uh, association of the private farmers has a, a special contest which is called uh, pestra Krajina. it's uh, called diverse countryside and they are trying to look, search for farmers that are doing something more than just uh, producing the food and they are getting giving them gold medal silver medal bronze medal they are doing some PR around, uh, around this uh, action. And I, when I was speaking to the big cooperatives and big, uh, the, 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 the NGO representing, representing uh, the, the big farms, I, I was telling them, if you mean seriously that you care about nature, protection, uh, biodiversity and environment, you should do something similar. You should also come up with something like 
something similar like uh, association with private farmers and create some own contests showing that also big farms can do uh, can um, farm sustainably and uh, with some um, you know with some aspects of biodiversity protection or something like it. But the pressure is strong and also green deal of EU is here. Uh, setting up uh, relatively ambitious targets uh, by 2030. So uh, farmers have to somehow deal with it. And of course, they don't want to change you know, quickly too much. So it's a process, but uh, it's process started. So hopefully it will be, you know, even, it will go farther than, than, than it is right now. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Okay. Hi, Rashid. Uh, Ahoy. Question. Uh, I'm counting birds uh, in uh, very intensive farmland uh, in lowland near Rovnice, and there it's quite depressive. But now I talk to Rashid Babaj, and he thinks now some uh, subsidies or some actions especially anti-erosion actions on Visochina have very positive uh, impact on uh, farmland birds that he thinks that, that it helps a lot. Uh, when you look on the data from the Republic, uh, do you see some uh, subventions to be so effective? Because until now, my general opinion was that uh, there are some small uh, actions that are very positive, like you, you, you said before. But, but in general, the uh, general situation is getting worse and worse. And this was completely new for me that there is some, some bigger change that is already positive. Well, I totally agree with you that the situation is getting worse. This morning, I was uh, taking picture of the of the field that was being plowed uh, a few days ago and uh, the dirt road I was uh, going on uh, was again, you know, the, the buffer strip was again smaller by, by some centi centimeters because uh, the picture of the farmers on the landscape features is still quite strong. And uh, there, is a, there is a new common agriculture policy with some new, new targets. And the question is how this will be finally uh, translated to the reality. We are asking for 10%, by the 2030, we should have 10% of non-productive non areas in farmland. Uh, the question is what those 10% could be. And, uh, and the most crucial thing is about changing the attitude of the farmers because they need to know that what we want from them is to keeping those buffer strips in some condition. We want to create them. And this is what the money should, you know, you know, this is what we should be paying them. You know? So example from my village, we have, uh, we are planting of uh, bushy strips uh, on the former uh, dirt, ro dirt roads that, uh, are, that have been plowed in the past. So it's a bushes, grassy, grassy strip with bushes. And uh, uh, recently, there should be also some uh, from cherry, uh, some elevated cherry trees. And farmer, instead of saying this is great that you are doing this, because the EU and Czech Ministry wants from me to have some percentage of the non-productive areas. So this is perfectly what I. This is something I will use. They are telling well. Okay, if city of Nechanice wants to do this, then okay, do it. It's yours. It's your property. But take it away from me and take care of it on, on your own. So they just leave it back to the city. And the situation will be, the, you know, next year that in in September, when I will be speaking to them, they will telling city is not taking uh, good care of, the, of this feature and it's spreading wheat out to the field. And it will be kind of, you know, uh, I can see it in, because this is happening right now. So instead of taking a chance and use it, uh, uh, say, okay, this is, we are going to take care of it. We are going to get some uh, 
area that will be uh, that will be needed, you know, for for subsidy uh, and taking uh, management uh, activity exactly how they need it, instead of they are leaving to the city and complaining about you know the problems. So this is the changing of the attitude I was I was speaking about. So so this new policy is bringing some tools that could be visible in country if the if it will be handled optimally. We are pushing for uh, motivation to reduce fuel size. We are pushing for motivation to create those um, non-productive uh, elements in the in the country. But uh, the situation currently is still open and uh, not really clear. You know if it if our pressure will be successful. So it's uh, what happened that the situation will slightly improve, but not uh, sufficiently enough. And then uh, in some areas, like you mentioned, in uh, North, uh, North Bohemia, it can remain almost the same. And this is also the, the other, another thing is that in the first pillar where direct, direct payment is, uh, uh, is paid from, there is new measure called Eco Scheme. And uh, there was a, this decision to move uh, uh, basic management of the grassland from the second pillar, uh, where agro environmental schemes to the and this way, it uh, the money for special measures like bio belts, uh, all those uh, on the enable field uh, can be saved. But again, now there's a there's a pressure to move this money, uh, this measure back to second pillar, which would uh, result in even less money for biodiversity and nature environment than it was now, that is right now. So. So everything is open and it can be disaster or it can be much better. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another question here, but uh, first, if anyone else. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I should have heard. <laughs> okay, I have one more question. We are this is in the European ground here, And this is also agricultural species in Czech Republic. But when you speak about the measures what the uh, ground squirrel needs, it could be completely different from the needs of another birds of agricultural land, you know. Then I am asking, is there any platform where we could like get in to that not the, all the measures are for the birds, but there are some measures which are also for the squirrel, which is also ground squirrel, which is also important prey species for some birds. So, you know, if you make all the hedges or field roads, former field roads, bushy, it's not for the ground squirrel group because they need the grassy habitat. So it would be probably quite good to have some coordination between these activities. So is there any platform where you put these activities that we know that, okay, this is planned to be bushy area, so our activity to make the grassland somewhere would be somewhere else? Well, this is this is not go coordinated at this moment. Uh, so the option, if it will succeed, and farmers will be forced to you know to to do non-productive elements, you know, bring some landscape features back in the country. And I am not really fully optimistic uh, that this is this will happen because uh, um, uh, there are several options how to you know to go around it. So if this happens, uh, we are pushing for uh, advisory service that would help farmers to make optimal solution based on the farm itself, based on the locations, based on the, all the data available about the area. So, but again, this is definitely going to be a long-term uh, long run and it's not uh, something that next year, you know, farmers will ask experts from biodiversity or entomologists, ornithologists, how to do it optimally. Um, we can, we are pushing for this, for this uh, um, uh, education or advisory service, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is no, ex at least what I know, there is no system of the educating those people to do it properly. So, uh, our advisors focused on economic issues, uh, how to you know get uh, the most of the money that are going to CAP. Uh, there are only few people that are able to advise optimally how to combine farming and biodiversity on environmental protection. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely, there is a, uh, it's a it's a big role also from of the Ministry of Environment to push for it. And, uh, definitely, advisory is going to be supported. And the question is, as I mentioned, the quality of it and also the willingness of the farmers to use those farmers to use those advisors and how much money you know how the system will be rewarding uh, the advisors to, you know, to to do it because, because we, the the capacity. City and willingness of the people to do it voluntary is of course limited. So if the money will be available, I'm, I can imagine that something can relatively in time, two years can something like it can can be established. Some comment to, to that topic, like the subsidies can um, uh, have quite some impact, yeah. And for example, again, you know, we are back to Saslik. There are agro and we subsidies for vineyards, which are to support mainly uh, butterflies. So they, they from because of the subsidies now, uh, wine growers have. Uh, grass very high in their grass, uh, in their in their wine vineyard, which is opposite what Sasik means. So <laughs> it's really uh, it would be really important to think about it that all those subsidies and, and things which are like which have big impact on large scale that there are enough enough divers or that farmers have different possibilities what they will support well because otherwise you can have then some species growing up and on the other hand some species can disappear. Yeah, definitely if you have uh, any comment on the current existing measure uh, or I don't know if you have access to the strategic plan that is being prepared by now uh, at this moment by Ministry of Agriculture but if you have Definitely any comment of uh, how management should be uh, improved or changed, you know, or other. The problem is uh, only that the ministry wants to keep measures uh, usually simply. So uh, uh, the same example would be with the uh, pollinator bio, bio belts, because uh, in that case, entomologists are uh, going for uh, Moving in two two time you know in different timing you know first mowing would be uh, early in the season and the second would later on so there will be always some kind of cover and not everything will be cut down at the same time uh, but the ministry is usually trying to keep the measures simply uh, so uh, they may say this is uh, this is optional you can do it but it's, they don't want to do it because. Uh, the area of those bio belts is relatively low because farmers don't, don't, there is no need for them to do it despite it's the finance somehow. So, so it's, a, it's a balance. If you want to do it perfectly, complicated and working uh, for all the species that you think of, or you can keep it simple and farm with, you know, with some chance that farmers will use it on the large scale. And uh, but at least in that second case, you can add some voluntary option and then work with the farmers on the local level and tell them, well, think about you know your situation. In most of the area, it's okay, but here there's a Suslik and uh, you have options to do it this way. Of course, it's not fully you know covered. You know the, the money it was some there are additional costs because he's, he needs to go with my advice or something like it. But you can uh, you can motivate him to do it that way. If, if you speak to the people directly, usually they usually if you some you usually find some way you know how to how to work with them. It's not possible to do it at this moment on the national level. That advisory service, if it would be working, then it would be the case. You know what they could do, but at least in some cases you can do it when you need it. So, but anyway, any any kind of uh, comment on existing scheme, you know what you don't like, what you like is. Uh, more than welcome because uh, we they are sending comments all the time and even if it will, will not be accepted still uh, it's good to say we have this problem it's written here and it wasn't accepted but you know next time it will be stronger and, you know uh, and this is moving moving this uh, subsidy system further so please look at it uh, in case of second pillar 
they are almost all the measures in the same way as it as they were. There, there are no major uh, changes is in setup so you know, even if you don't have strategic plan and you just know uh, what you don't like about existing measure send it send it to me or you know to me optimally and i will use it or, or, or ministry of environment people in our ECA agency uh, they will work with it okay thank you we have to make a break now, but I, I just, I, I was very interested, but one of your last slides where you show um, a, heat map in a, a heat map in a field uh, showing the, the yield productivity in, in this field. Yes, yes, yes. And my question is, um, well, could you tell us a bit more about this? Because it, it seems like a perfect tool to, to combine and, and so make everybody happy. And also another small question is uh, how consistent it is year by year? Like when would you give that information to the farmer? Like this is what we predict you to have success next year, but how reliable will that be? Yeah, this is this is a one big uh, topic, and it's uh, somehow connected the precision farming. And precision farming is something being supported by the European Commission. It's being supported also by Ministry of Agriculture, and it's about new technologies and it's about collecting data from the field. So, uh, one of the outcome is this yield map uh, showing which part of the field are more fertile and which are, which part of the field are not so much fer fertile. And this re usually remains uh, over the years uh, the similar. Of course, some crops have slightly different uh, demands than, than the others. So uh, there could be differences in uh, in different crops uh, during among years, but definitely, uh, and farmers usually know it even without those yield maps. They usually see which parts of the fields are where it is growing better, but it's not growing so much. It can be caused by you know uh, some uh, uh, impact of the forest edge, you know, because uh, there is less water or something like it. So. So they know it, and if they if they, it's proved by this uh, technical data, then it's even more you know more visible. So, uh, so so this is optimal to how to you know if you are thinking of how to place bio belts, where to place bio belt, then you can tell him if you place it to the, next to the forest, even without this map, it has already one impact because in the forest we have deer and all those you know big mammals. And those deer, when are coming, uh, you know, from the forest to feed themselves on the field, mm -hmm. if you put, if you put biobel there, the first thing they will find is biobel, and it's usually quite diverse in structure and in you know in the crops. So it's not no mono diet like field. So they are they they will definitely feed themselves in biobel uh, more likely than in the field. And so yeah, you're reducing the, the uh, you know the damage that is causing this deer to your crop. So this is clear economic you know, argument they can use. Uh, then you have this map and you can tell him if you place it here in the middle, uh, it's working good also maybe for erosion because the problem why it's not growing there is maybe because the shape of the field is you know, up and going down. And if you place it in the, in the, in the, in the high peak, then uh, maybe the water doesn't get the speed when it's raining and it stays there. So um, it, 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 uh, uh, it can be also a tool how to limit erosion. So maybe erosion map could be useful as well. Uh, and um, yeah, and even farmers, sometimes they, they tell them, so they, they, they tell me that they know that in some part of the field, economic for them, you know, to, to, to do uh, the commercial crop because uh, the cost uh, that is behind it, uh, you need to buy the seed, you need to, you know, buy gas, you have to pay the tractor and all those issues are finally so high that the yield are not uh, fully compensating the, the cost. So, so, and by putting there something like BioBelt, you have secured income that is uh, set up, you know, the level that it should be okay from economic point of view. And we know that it's okay. And at the same time, you are doing something for biodiversity. You are 
supporting natural, you know, um, uh, functioning of the ecosystems. So, so it's again, it could be a win-win solution. The problem connected with the biobells is that um, farmers are getting in the risk of a high number of control uh, administration. Uh, of course, there are some uh, some conditions like nobody should be driving across biobelt. And they, of course, they are not uh, able to secure that neighbor from next neighbor from village uh, will take four wheeler and go across the field through the bio belt. So they, this is the problems, maybe more on social and mental uh, side than than the economic side. That why they don't want to you know to use it. But definitely the, the pressure from the ministry and from public society is here. And uh, with those tools, with those maps, you know, it's another, you know, it's, it's another step how to, you know, to get those measures in the field. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Asek, and, and thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, well, we have time now for lunch. So what we will do is, uh, well, first, thank you. Okay. Let's get think... to a final <laughs> session. <then. laughs> I thank you for your attention and enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Ciao.